My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. Hi, thank you for joining in for another episode of my podcast. My guest today is Krista Rhyme. Krista is a startup founder and advisor, an app developer, and a web analytics expert in beautiful San Jose, California. Thank you for taking some time to speak with us today, Krista. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. I like to start at the beginning. And you said on one of your profiles that you grew up as a transracial adoptee raised by racist parents. Now, that's a, a gut punch emotionally and intellectually. How did that come to take place, first of all, that you were placed with them? Then I want to ask you some follow-up questions on that. Yeah, so I was born a complete secret, like nobody knew I existed except for my birth mother, um, the doctors and the nurses that delivered me. She promptly placed me for adoption into a Catholic Charities organization. Um, and then I was placed with a conservative white evangelical couple in rural Minnesota in a tiny town called Spicer, which had about 1,200 people. Um, so that's that's how I started out. Okay. So when – can you, first of all, def, define transracial? Because I know a lot of people don't know what that means. If you were to ask me, I might – I might be incorrect. Yeah, so transracial is when um, you are an adoptee um, and placed with a family that is different from the race you identify with. So me being black, I was placed with a white couple. Um, it could be there's a lot of transracial adoptees that are Asian and placed like with a white couple. So is it correct that that's a term that um, the Child Protective Services or, or whatever the agency is, it's, it's a term they came up with? Honestly, I first heard of this term when I started seeking out support groups for adoption. And when I moved to California, there was a great support group out in Oakland. Um, and that's where I started her hearing the term of transracial adoptees. Um, and so this group was for um, people of color that are transracial adoptees because they can go the other way too, right? You could be a white child and placed with black parents, but you know, that rarely ever happens. But um, yeah, so it just means being placed outside of your race. And like I was first introduced to it um, in a more liberal area when I um, found a, an adoptive support group. Okay. Do you, now, what was that like growing up there, and at what age or developmental stage did you become aware of the context that you were being raised in, and that your your parents were inherently racist, that there was an issue going on? Yeah, so growing up, I think my first memory, I was around three of that I was different. Um, I was at a preschool. The preschool, there was a car pickup group with all the moms. And I remember one time before preschool, I was waiting to be picked up, hoping that that car would not come to my driveway and take me to preschool. Um, because when I was there, like the kids would rub my skin and touch my hair. And, you know, I looked completely different. And that's when I knew I was different. Um, in terms of my parents, 
um, where I would describe them as being racist. Um, it probably wasn't until I was things like Minneapolis, my adoptive mother would see a group of black men walking down the street and she would take off her diamond rings, right? Or cross the street. Uh, I'm like, okay. Or just intentionally keeping me from the black community. I wasn't allowed to be with other black children unless they were from also adoptive, you know, families and circumstances. The first time I was introduced to Martin Luther King Jr. Um, was in school because another classmate said I have a dream. And she told me about, you know, introducing me to Black history and things like that. And so as I became older, I realized that they structurally kept me community because they viewed my community as less than. Um, and there's a lot of religious aspects to it, you know, being, um, I was raised in the Evangelical Free Church of America. They inherently viewed the power to go out and save people that didn't look like them and to convert them to Christianity. Um, and so that's when I started understanding that an environment that wasn't grow and thrive unless I, I conformed to their, their beliefs. Okay. Now, how is that relationship now? Has it matured or, or is it more of, you know, I acknowledge it, but you know, it, it's, it is what it is. How is that right now? Now that you're an adult and everything. Um, I do not have contact with uh, my adoptive family. I to cut contact off and then work on me and truly figure out who I am. Because of all of this um, growing up, I did. I was code switching all the time, to, you know, to fit in, to survive. And with that, I lost my identity. Um, so I decided mm. to leave, cut off my relationship, and then work on me to form my identity, my own beliefs, my own values, to do my own own research, right? To be around different types of people and get different perspectives. Um, and that's when I really started to grow as an individual is once I was able to leave um, my toxic environment. Okay. Now your background and experience in tech, specifically in web analytics, goes back to 2006. Now, to put that in context, I began studying web design and content marketing and how those related SEO back in the mid 90s. And the irony is, is that your vast experience is in your experience is that business owners who can benefit the most from web analytics and the role SEO plays in that are usually the ones least likely to invest for web analytics ROI. Is that valid? And I wanted to get your take on that. Is that valid? And if so, why? So I was in big organizations most of my career. I didn't really invest, but they had the resources to invest. Um, you know, they had teams to, just to educate around that. Where I feel like your statement would be true would be smaller to medium-sized businesses. Yeah. That's also, um, right, access to talent, um, access to tools. Um, you know, Google Analytics was free, um, but you have to have somebody that's knowledgeable enough to interpret that data and drive change. Um, and good in that space, you're competing with, you know, the Googles, <laughs> the Facebooks, you know, it's like the big companies. And so um, that's why I see that there was a big gap. It's just medium-sized businesses, one, don't understand the value necessarily. And if they did, they didn't have the same access to the talent, to the tools that the larger enterprises did. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because uh, in a lot of cases, they don't really see the value in it, like you said, 
or where do I get someone to help me? I will ask somebody on Facebook who may or may not be able to help, or I'll look for someone on Craigslist or whatever. And it's pretty much um, a random thing. What drove your interest in web analytics specifically? You went to college studying science and finance. So how did those two come together for you to form that interest in web analytics specifically? Uh, um, I guess one, um, after I graduated from college, offered any jobs in the financial area that really interests me. Um, so I just, you know, started reading different types of jobs and a web analyst popped up. And I'm like, this sounds interesting to be able to understand how people use websites, right? Um, and then not only to understand that, but to make decisions and see if what your hypothesis is actually changed their behavior in the way you wanted. Um, so I was really fascinated with that. Um, so I applied company and um, during the time I applied to my interview was two weeks. I got every um, book um, blog that I could to learn about web analytics and I was able to at least speak to it during my interview. Um, I was honest. I'm like, this is new for me. Um, but my um, my then hiring manager is like, yeah, you have drive. You learned a lot in two weeks. Like, let's take a chance on you. And they gave me a job, which I will say that does not happen anymore where hiring managers look at your potential and how you go about things and say like, we'll bring you on and we'll teach you, you know, how to do this job. Just happened to be in that era where that was still happening. And then once I got my hands on these tools, um, the financial um, piece would kick in because I would be analyzing a lot of marketing campaigns. Right. So for spending, you know, $10,000 here, what's our conversion rate, what's our return on our ad spend. And so I got to blend the two of like my love of numbers, but also with um, user behavior humans. And um, while it is a bunch of numbers, I always people using the website and are they able to accomplish what they want to. And it was my job to help make that easier for them. So, yeah, it goes back to people and user experience and analyzing the metrics and seeing what resonates with some but not with others and, and why, what's the logic behind that. Do you think for the most part, just out of curiosity, that web analytics are being used for legitimate say ethical purposes or do you think it's veering more toward the cambridge analytica end of the spectrum yeah um i mean i would say it's veering more towards um what i would say weaponizing based off of the company's business model. So if they're a, a for maximum profit model, right? And um, most are. Yeah. And you're going to be able to use that data in ways um, that I believe is not ethical or um, not disclosing to the users how they're using the data, right? Um, I mean, you can take it's not just me anymore looking at numbers and analyzing this. It's now algorithms are being used off of this uh, machine learning, um, which can take on a life of its own. That's why we're seeing some of the divisiveness in the United States, because you can actually get caught in like a self-fulfilling loop. If I look at one video, they're going to show me 20 more videos like that. And I'm like, oh, I, I reaffirm my original belief rather than let's look at multiple different scenarios and come to a conclusion. Um, and this is all designed to do this in a programmatic way. So I, I think without regulation and oversight, we're going to be um, in a very uncomfortable situations to come, even more dangerous situations in the future. More partisan, more tribal. Uh, at face value, at the superficial level, it would at the superficial level, I don't really get it. 
from a marketing perspective, I can get it to an extent because it's like if I'm looking for glasses online, I'm looking for blue glasses online. So and this happened. So like you said, no matter where I look online, I keep seeing ads for blue glasses again. Well, you can get them like Christo or you could get the, the John Lennon ones or I could get the little ones or whatever. But after a while, you start to think, well, you know, it doesn't have to be the same shape or model or even color. It could be different. But I don't see those ads. You would think that the variety would be more mental stimulation. I mean, at a smaller level, there are tests going on. So I think it was Netflix. At any given moment, they run about 100 different tests on you. And so what they're doing is maybe running a test about showing different color glasses. But if people don't respond to that, they deem like, no, we're not getting enough return on these type of people to do that. But as we come in more and more personalization, they will figure out that you want only blue glasses, but I want glasses with every color of the rainbow. And they'll start serving that to me being served all these different experiences are we supposed to come together and really share an experience like what's really real anymore you know is everything so manufactured right well if it's online that's it's 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 dubious because for news i look at the new yorker i look at the new york times i look at some of the the established ones that uh, entities, I should say, the established online publications and entities that I know have a really good reputation and in, in history behind them. But for specific social media sites or individuals, I don't really take them seriously until we have some kind of interaction beforehand, like, like what we're doing now, simply because there's so much catfishing and spamming and and scamming going on and anybody can post a, a photo and say that uh, you know uh, corn muffin one two three is this person who just happens to look like a supermodel or a cartoon character and i i think i think dave Chappelle put it really well when he said that when you post on social media you're basically writing on the bathroom wall <laughs> yes. you know i used when I went to college, I mean, my university, the bathroom walls were like comic strip circus. I mean, you, you, it was just everywhere, you know, and it's like, you didn't look at it. You didn't take it seriously. But by when people look at social media and go, Oh, you know, uh, you know, sunset one, two, three says that, uh, COVID is a conspiracy and they get all bent out of shape. It's, it's almost like a trip away from logic it's an emotional appeal and that does seem to become more prevalent. What, what can people do to break away from that if they feel themselves falling into that? And this is completely away from my list of questions, but I wanted to ask you because I know it's your industry. Um, I know this will sound very Californian, but take a digital cleanse. After so many times I have deleted my social media apps for months and you know what, my mental health is better. Um, and plus when you're not on your social apps all the time, it makes room for you to go, go outside, take a walk, go commune with nature, go a coffee, a beer, whatever. But it, 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 it takes up so much of our life and it can also be depressive depending upon yeah. the type of content we are continually consuming or what we see and try strive to be right. We see all these beautiful influencers like living these great lives, right? As that's what they want us to think. And then am I living up to that? Like, should I be doing that? And so when you're able just to, you know, put it away for a while and just focus on you, um, I feel like that's the healthy thing to do. You should do, you should do everything in moderation, basically. And social media is one, one of those things too. Yeah. And I agree with you a hundred percent about detoxing and cleansing and, you know, different people enjoy different things. 
I mean, I'm in Florida right now where we have the rainy season. It's like a monsoon rain two or three times a day. But prior to that, I used to love just disappearing into a forest and just walking for a couple of hours and just being alone. No podcast, no music, no audio books, nothing. Just how many birds are there right now? Are there any wild cows I need to worry about out here? Because they're out in this area. And the cows will leave you alone. You just have to watch out for their little items they leave in your walking path, so to speak. Um, let me ask you, you're currently involved in three businesses, when I counted, that may or may not be connected. Can you talk about your role in Shopify's Pride Places and Crutix or Crutix? Ticks, I, I know I'm butchering that word. Yeah. So can you please talk about your role in those and what you do in each role and where maybe they intersect? Because I think that's particularly interesting. Fruit X, that is a company I founded. Um, so out my 14 years of being in tech, I was in big tech. So PayPal, Nike, Expedia, Realtor. And throughout my career, I probably only saw about 10 other black people. And so I experienced firsthand the lack of diversity in tech. So now I'm shifting away from big tech. I have my own startup and it is to connect top diverse talent with inclusive startups. Um, I came up with my um, talent led growth model that is based off of three pillars of hiring, um, recruiting and hiring, onboarding your employee and creating a great cultural experience within this framework is embedded with DEI. And so my goal with Crude X is to diversify tech and make it accessible no matter what background you come from. Um, company I work with is um, Pride Places. It says I'm an advisor on my LinkedIn, but I am actually now a co-founder. Mm. And what we are doing is we are creating safe places for people in the LGBTQ plus community to go and just be. Um, our original vision was to connect um, people with businesses that are either gay owned or friendly, um, but it's a highly competitive area, especially with Yelp. And so now we are re-examining of creating safe digital spaces. So different rooms for people to go into, but also that will enrich your life. So we will have a room for finance, we'll have a room for health, we'll have a room for entertainment, and we'll be holding various events in these digital rooms. And then it'll also be a forum where people can like commune, get support from each other and things of that nature. So, and ask a lot of people, and I've, I've done a few talks around this and again and again, um, people in the community um, go, go to the internet and forums to find like-minded people and get support. And so I feel like we, we could do that and then also create resources to enrich people's lives um, and create digital safe places that are accessible by all. So that's Pride Places. And then finally there's Shopavides where I'm an advisor and I advise in both the data and marketing capacity. And Shopavides is disrupting the way we will shop. They are creating a fully immersive experience based off of your mood boards or palettes. Mm, so okay. you might have a mood board of like urban and it will be um, these beautiful boards that will bring in all types of clothing styles that are particular to your style. Um, and you'll be able to shop a lot of different projects, but then also while you're shopping, you know, you'll be able to have customized playlists playing for you. Um, in the future, they will even be able to um, you'll be able to sync um, if you have smart lights, right? And so your lights will change based off the moods that you're shopping. But it's a completely mm -hmm. curated experience. It will be personalized and it will be based off of different, um, in your mood or your entire style instead of going out and trying to, you know, create all that. So for you, you would have maybe a blue mood and we would bring I'm in feeling a lot of blue. different- yeah. And then, you know, you like jazz or rap and you would have that playing while you browse through these different um, mood boards. So we really want to create uh, a way for people to be creative 
um, get the shopping items that they need and to have a fully immersive experience. So I'm really having fun with them, helping them roll out their great marketing campaigns. Um, and then I also go and and spread the word and help them, you know, talk to investors and possible partners and such. So it kind of sounds like a mall in your mind approach. Yeah. So as a adv advisor or co-founder, what would you look at their daily numbers? Would you look at the website conversions? Would you look at their, their card abandonment or all of the above or more of an overview, broader perspective? Yeah, so in both startups, we are, oh, all my startups are in early stage. So what I help do is um, create the framework of how we're gonna capture data once we roll it out and data starts rolling in. Um, uh, Pride Places is a fairly simple data architecture. Um, the data architecture for Shopify's will not be because it will be so personalized. And then we also will be dealing with, you know, tens of thousands of different SKUs or products and items pulling in. And so um, that will be harder to architect. Um, and then it will also be using a lot of algorithm and like machine learning. Um, so I'm advising about how to capture all that data so we can provide a really excellent experience. And then from the marketing standpoint, I go out and do market research, give suggestions about the different types of campaigns we should be rolling out, who we should be partnering with, you know, things of that nature to awareness. Okay. I want to get your take on the equity in employment, but also recruiting. What challenges do you see today post COVID-19 with equitable remote job seeking, but then also the subsequent employment? What role do employers play in that mix and what potential stumbling blocks do you see? Yeah, so when I first started recruiting, um, I would talk with a lot of people. They would like to pick out of the groups of what they want like oh it'd be really nice if we had a black woman or a queer person and it wasn't an approach of a, a systemic approach um so that's why i went back and like create this framework so we could really look at your organization understand what the makeup is where do we need to go and then really going out and targeting different groups and um have them come in and be a part of that process where the equity comes into play is not everybody is able to have the same opportunities, especially in tech. And so when you are looking at the qualifications, the whole person, what chances have they had to grow? Um, and if those chances aren't there, what are their transferable skills? Do they possess the ability to grow in the right support structures? And that's where I come in and champion the candidates that I work with and get you know, the hiring teams to think in that nature of, of potential. What is the long-term goal here? What is the role that you have previously played in limiting opportunities for people, right? Um, and so I think that's where the equity comes into play is really looking at the whole person, what the potential is, transferable skills, and like how your company um, can make an impact. How did Silicon Valley, I mean, when, when we think of Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, you see the stock images, you see these companies featured in the news. If you look for diversity, you don't see it. And when I say diversity, I mean across the board. I never see anybody who looks like they're above 25, um, you know. Um, you just don't. And that's just, you know, from the perspective of someone who worked for all these agencies for, you know, decades. And after you reach a certain age, they won't hire you unless you know someone who can get you in. I wanted to get your take on how Silicon Valley has become so hermetically sealed. How do you hold them accountable? Yeah, I mean, about how I broke in. One, I had a high in demand job, but after I applied for that first job I told you about, I never applied for another job again. And it was all through my network. 
Um, and so if you have a limited network and you're only hiring your friends and you hang out around like people, um, that's why I believe we see a complete lack of diversity. And there's like stereotypes and structural things that go in with that too, with different groups of capable of holding certain jobs in tech and that nature. And I always like to go back to a report that I read from Dahlberg and partnered with Intel that if tech were my diverse and inclusive, it was more diverse and inclusive, it could add $470 billion to the market. And that really made me take a pause. America, right? Like America doesn't like to leave money on the table. And if it is leaving money on the table, there are huge structural reasons for that, right? And so I feel like that's even further validation of it just being a structurally exclusive group. Um, and we need to show the value of diversity of new thought leadership, right? Reaching new communities. Um, I remember when the um, iPhone X came out and that was the first, first phone that had facial recognition for me. Um, and it, it wouldn't work in, at night with me because it couldn't pick up my skin. Um, you know what? Two releases later, they did the backlight and now it works. But imagine how many more people could have had a pleasurable experience that are darker skin if they had somebody on the team that would recognize, like, this doesn't work on me, right? And right. So that's what then I'm that saying, person would see that. More, so making it more diverse and inclusive can open up tons of markets, open up new thought leadership, um, and just create a more pleasurable experience for everybody, which is, is money. Toward that end, being African American in Silicon Valley, I mean, what limitations are placed on you and what, if anything, is being done to decrease the, the, the restraints? Yeah, so I feel like I made it as long as Silicon Valley was because of how I grew up. So I navigated in spaces that were not meant for me my entire life and learned how to survive. So coming to Silicon Valley wasn't that scary for me. In fact, the more I reflect now, I'm like, how did I do that? Like, that's crazy. <laughs> but um, I had a lot of limitations. Um, for one company, I did a whole data architecture, like a redo of an implementation that I wanted to do. I spent months on it. It was very well documented, very well planned. I presented it to leadership. They're like, oh, this is great, Krista, but let's get a second opinion. They um, brought in a consulting firm, paid them over $250,000, and the presenter of the consulting firm said, uh, we agree with every one of Chris's recommendations. And I always had to have a second validation. No one would ever just take my word. But in fact, that firm later recognized what happened. And they're like, if you, if you ever want to come work for us, we'll give you a job. Um, but that was like a career of always having to have another second validation or else um, I even had managers like steal my work Mm -hmm. And then I would see them get promoted, right? And like, where I I'm not getting promoted. Like the way that I climbed the ladder, I have to leave a company to jump at my new company. Um, so that's where I learned to survive is like do a really great job, get that experience. I know the next company I go to, I can get that increase in title or or raise. Um, and I that's just not. For me, I feel like that's just a lot of women in Silicon Valley and other marginalized groups. And that's probably why we're seeing such a short tenor at companies. I think, what is it, like 14 or 18 months is like the average yes. in tech, right? Yeah, that's exactly yeah. it. I lost track of how many agencies I worked at, quite frankly, because, yeah, the 12 months is, was huge. The last agency I worked at, I was there for a long time, but part of that was recognition of the fact that you're getting older. If you leave this agency, nobody will hire you. You're unhirable, basically. So, no, I, you know. I champion um, age, both young and old. So if you're young, you can't get in because you don't have three to five years of experience. 
And then I think I read an article, if it's after 35, yeah. it decreases by like eight grand a year yeah. per company. <laughs> the, yeah. The, the last agency I interviewed at was maybe three years ago. And I was very blessed. I didn't have to worry about the money that much. I, you know, thank God, especially right now. But I, I still enjoy the work. And so I went to this agency and I'll never forget. I walked into the lobby of the agency and I saw this photo on the reception desk, took out my phone, took a photo of that photos and texted it to my wife. And I put OMFG. And the photo was a guy who looked like he was my age, only with, you know, gray beard and gray hair. I shaved mine off. So he's standing and he's surrounded by about 10 young white women, look like they're around 25 years old, all with like dyed blonde hair. And they're all standing or on his right and left, like looking at him adoringly, like he's, you know, J the risen Jesus and maybe two or three nerdy guys, but they're all in their twenties. So I sent her that photo and then I just texted. I just said, don't think I'm going to be getting this. But anyway, I went into the interview and he was like a half hour late. The other people interviewing me are like in their twenties and they're like, so you know about this SEO thing, ha ha ha, just so awkward. And, and then he finally comes in a half hour late. Every five seconds, he's looking at his phone. He gets up every couple of minutes and he comes back like 10 minutes later. And at the end of the interview, I'm just like, yeah, thanks a lot, guys. And I just walked out the door. I really wish I had said to him, honestly, man to man, you're disrespectful. You're rude. I could run this agency. I don't want to run the agency. I just want to be able to contribute and do work that I love for a respectable, honest living wage. You treated me this way that I don't like. Have a nice day. You know, I, I kind of wish I had done that, but I'm also glad I didn't say that because I'm a very non-confrontational guy. But that sticks in my mind as a recruiter and you're involved with people lead, how do you stop that type of thing from happening yeah. and try to reverse that? Yeah, so I was gonna say, um, your recruiter failed you. And so I feel like it's a recruiter's job to be your a can, a advocate for the candidate, right? Uh, and be really transparent with them. So when I um, go out, I work with my clients or searching for new clients, I really assess their their culture, their environment. Um, and I've told a couple people, I'm like, I'm not gonna recruit for you. There's no way I would send somebody in here and sleep at night. Um, and I'm hoping that more recruiters take this advocacy stance and really start being an advocate and champion um, for your candidate. I mean, age thing, um, who would you want? Do you want a, a doctor that's just been in the field for two years or 20? Do you want a brand new auto, mo auto mechanic or somebody that's experienced? So I don't understand why tech has this age phobia. And then also guests are mature also use tech. And so you're just excluding them from creating experiences. Again, you're leaving money on the table. Um, we can't just have a certain subset of groups experiences that is just seriously tossed upon all of us. You know, we, we want to be included in how, how we want that experience too. And I, and it starts with recruiting. It starts with founders, um, laying out what type of culture am I going to have? Right. Um, time, like there's two you'll be me too right yeah. if you that you know it's so quickly now if you have a toxic culture everybody will know about it so it's just not even good from a business practice to go through you're on you have a lot of listeners on your podcast right if you would say that name of that company nobody would want to go work there based off of how they treated you Right? Like somebody is always watching, always listening and can tell the masses and people should start to be acting 
like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I could probably start a podcast and just, um, what was that one? I, I don't remember if they still have a podcast or not, uh, Clients from Hell. I'm sure you've heard of that. <laughs> I, I don't know what, what if the website still exists or if their podcast is still around, but it was a very cathartic website for developers that we would look at and share you know, nightmare scenarios that we've had anonymously. Um, I've, I've had interviews where there was one, I remember telling um, somebody on another podcast where the person interviewing me was like seven feet tall, maybe six ten, something like that. And I was a lot heavier at the time, but still we're not going into a wrestling ring, right? The guy, and they're standing nose to nose with me you know really trying to intimidate and browbeat and i'm thinking i don't want to go through this every day with you i'm being interviewed by you and i'm looking for glass or something i can pick up just in case because i feel that you know aware of this un being uncomfortable um let me ask you the technical side of of recruiting when I looked at your background, I thought what was really fascinating was there's so much that you have going on. I mean, there's so much depth with Recruitex or Recruitex. I keep butchering it, but not intentionally. But anyway, what role do you think videos play in in applicants and job seeking today? How important is the resume? Should they be text? so that they can be scanned. Is that still being done? I've always heard, don't put your photo on your resume because then they can be accused of uh, discrimination. Can you break some of that down? Yeah, so there is a lot of um, anonymous, um, anonymizing the resume and the whole interview process. Um, for me, um, by doing video interviews, so I do first round interviews with a lot of my candidates. One, um, I feel like it's more personable, but then I also um, have them highlight their work, a project that they've done. So you'll get to see what it'd be like working with this person and the type of work that they do that a resume just cannot um, a resume is just a lot of bullet point outcomes, but we also need to look at the type of person doing the input to get the outcome. I um, have been doing video resumes. I do a series of assessments too, and I do assessments not to eliminate or disqualify, but to really understand how you fit into the marketplace. Um, for example, in my previous life, super energetic. I had to go talk to many teams, be very persuasive, but I am naturally an introvert. Like, oh, I would be so deflated, yeah. but I knew I had to turn it up. So as some of these assessments would show that I'm an introvert, I would be disqualified. But now that my candidates know what these companies are looking at, they can speak to and give stories to how they will still fit that job based off the skills and qualifications. And this assessment isn't a true representation of what they can do. Um, so what I'm trying to do is get all the information out, out front, transparent, that is typically done on the first you know, interview, digitize that, and then um, get, present that to my clients. But also it's a tool that my candidates can use that they have this digital profile. And I teach them how to find hiring managers and teams and give them their profile and bypass the application system, the applicant tracking system, yeah. which you know will automatically filter a lot of people out and they're missing out on great talent. So I'm trying to come in at a different angle of humanizing this whole process, but also empower my candidates for them to promote themselves and come in sideways to hiring teams and showing how they're different and how they'll add value. Yeah, it's very important, I think, from from the employee's perspective, working for the agency or as the freelancer to try to find some way to break through the impersonal processes of the screening so how can you do that effectively for example if you're an older white guy 
uh, is it really in your better interest to have your image on a resume or do a video, even if you're tech savvy, when you may think, hey, I don't want them to know my age so that they cannot discriminate against me. Could I do a, a video without showing your face, for example? Would that yeah. be beneficial? Beneficial. So I've had a couple candidates that have only done slide presentations and we don't see their face, right? Um, but yeah, so there's ways around that. I would say also do your research. Um, research the company, connect with other people in the company that if you can find people that look like you, ask them what their experience mm. is, um, you know, and then get a feel for it. Because um, I say there's many companies that, okay, you take off your face yourself as much as you can, you get through and you might be entering a horrible, toxic environment. Right. Because if they knew who you were, they would have probably filtered you out. So do you really want to work at a company that you have to like be so anonymous because they can't control their bias. Um, I will say there's a lot of great companies out there that have initiatives, they're creating amazing work cultures um, that, that people should be seeking out. Those companies should be rewarded with great talent because you know you have great stock prices. So as a recruiter, do you have an awareness or uh what's the expression your finger on the pulse of company so for example you would know company abc would not be a good fit for this person or you know because this is what they want or you know or the company b might be a better fit for so and so yeah yeah so i have a um a lot of heart to heart talks with my candidates around the different types of companies um, with me being in tech for so long here in Silicon Valley, I've had a numerous amount of friends work at different companies. So I get a lot of um, inside information from, you know, the more well-known companies. And then for the companies I work with, I meet with the founders, I meet with hiring teams, I meet with the recruiting, the internal recruiting staff. And I have a great sense of, you know, are they just being performative or they really have a plan in place of wanting to be different and inclusive. Um, and if I feel like, yes, you have a plan in place, I will, I will candidates with you. Um, there's other companies where, or yet, you know, they're performative or, you know, you just have a huge turnover rate. Let's talk about that. If you can't, put your finger on why people are fleeing, like that's a big red flag, right? And so I'll be like, I'll help you figure this out if you want, but like right now, I don't wanna add to your problems. You need to solve your core issues. Um, so yeah, I go in and do thorough interviews and vet like all the companies I work for and try and keep on top of the other companies in the va Valley to see um, how their culture is, if they're changing or if it's a culture I would wanna put somebody in. To circle back or maybe to tie things up, I should say, what would your advice be for struggling freelancers who, you know, they might be looking at Indeed or uh, Media Bistro or some of these other sites and, and they're trying to find as much remote work as possible. I know a lot of developers who don't want to go into the office right now for obvious reasons, but they also just want more work period to pay the rent. What would your advice be? Should they just all get in touch with you and just say, Krista, help me? Yeah, I mean, you can get in touch with me. I am definitely willing to help you. I give out free consultations, but a couple of things. One, um, become the expert in your field blogging start doing a podcast i know multiple people who are trying to break into product management they wrote a book they started getting noticed and they got you know they got hired so become an expert in your field even if you're just starting to learn in that field um, and then stand out you know be creative create videos create presentations um, and bypass the application system um, there's multiple ways of finding out who's hiring on LinkedIn by org structure. So start looking for the director role of what you want to be or 
you know, the head of people. And that's another thing. Look for head of people instead of head of HR. That tells you a little bit about the culture, right? Um, things like that and bypass and start connecting, um, connect with other people in the same position and be like, Hey, now that you know me, will you refer me? Because a lot of companies have mm. referral bonuses, right? Um, mm. And so net is huge. And there, the more you're connecting with people, the more you show yourself as an authority, the more opportunities you'll have. So if I'm a digital marketing specialist, which is a very broad term, I would want to contact other digital marketing specialists but the odds would be that many wouldn't have the same experience. So I would look for the ones with commens yeah. commensurate levels of experience and say, what is it like where you work? Do you uh, offer white label work? Do you need help with anything? Things of that nature. So if someone is an expert in SEO, uh, they would look for senior uh, SEOs at uh, agencies or other companies. Yeah, and then there's also a lot of great contracting companies that are out there. I you know for a while when I ability, I would do some contract consulting work. Um, one great company that I loved was Harnum. Um, so I can hook you up with people over there, but there's other companies that will do that legwork for you and find you a contract. I mean, they still take a nice chunk of your pay, but it's steady work. Right. right but they're your headhunter. Now, as far as LinkedIn is concerned, how effective or advisable would you say it would be to have your LinkedIn profile such that uh, there's a setting where you can say, I'm going to be receptive to recruiters. How effective or advisable is that? I had that setting enabled at one point and I was getting emails. I still get them on a daily basis, but I don't respond anymore because you never hear anything back unless you, I guess what I'm, I'm also kind of saying a larger question where in the old days it used to be, look, your resume has to mirror identically the stated text of the, the ad or the, 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 the position. Is yeah, that. So in, so in marketing, we talk about personalization a lot, right? And so you should never just have one resume. I think I have like five resumes that I would use depending upon the type of job I was going after. Um, so you can do that um, in terms of the LinkedIn setting. Yes, you will get a lot of recruiters, um, but you might not hear from them. And so that's why I would say, you know, keep that on. But people that are already in those positions um, bypass the recruiter. I'm completely bypass recruiters, bypass applications, like leverage your connections, build your connections. I think you can do a hundred connections in a week with LinkedIn. You should be using those hundred connections every single week of reaching out. It's something as simple as like, Hey, I see we're in the same industry. I would love to expand my network so I can learn more about you mm -hmm. and the work that you're doing. People will accept it. Thanks for the connection. Can we stay in touch? Yeah. You like a post, by the way, I see you're hiring. Like, can you check out, you know, my resume or this video that I made be even more proactive and make it like a little intro video when you connect with somebody and say, thanks for the connection. I think people are just wanting so much chin and personalization now, since we've been separated for a year and a half, that if you come with like videos and vision and bypass the system, people will be very receptive to it. Okay, I think those are some really good tips. Um, let me ask you, what are your short term and long term uh, goals look like? Since you're yeah. you've got your fingers in so many different things. So my main focus is on my um, company Crude X. Right now, I'm just ramping up on my recruiting arm and making um, revenue that way. And then doing a beta for my um, talent led growth program with a couple startups. So I can learn and then build a platform out of it. 
I hope the revenue that I get from recruiting will help, um, will fund my MVP um, platform and then take it from there and just start growing and systemically usher in diverse talent into tech with startups. Okay, well, I definitely need to learn more about Crutex. Let me ask you my final question for those watching or listening who want to get in touch with you and maybe get your help or learn more about the different projects you're involved in, or they may want to get your, your help with mentoring or any mm -hmm. uh, number of issues. How can they best uh, get in touch with you? Yeah, um, I live a lot on LinkedIn. So if you just search for Krista, K-R-I-S-T-A, Ryan. R I M is in Mary E. You will find me on LinkedIn. Send me a connection request, and I'm happy to talk with you. Um, or you can shoot me an email at Krista at CruteX.com. That's C R U I T X. And I am eager to meet you and connect and help you with your career journey. Okay. Well, listen, I'd love to. Uh, ask you a couple of questions off the record. So please stick around. And I want to thank you for taking the time to be a guest on this podcast and to speak to those watching or listening. So thank you so much for that. And uh, please stick around. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.